land of the free and the home of the brave. The new world whose discovery doubled the frontiers of the known world. A promised land where people flocked for a chance to make their dreams come true. of great opportunity, provided you do your work. Whether you're black, brown, blue, green, whatever you are, if you apply yourself, you can, the whole world is in front of you. Well, I think you very much see Indians contributing to many spheres of America, uh, where in the past, you know, traditionally Indians would be doctors or engineers, but now you see Indians in politics, you see Indians in academia, you see Indians in uh, many other fields. Yoga is hugely, hugely popular in the U.S. Uh, spreading all over the place, becoming very, very popular. There's a yoga studio on every you know, street corner uh, in the U.S. Uh, there's uh, Indian food is getting more and more popular. You know, has, has always been popular and it's becoming more popular. Uh, Bollywood dancing and music is becoming very popular. So uh, I think a lot of aspects of uh, Indian culture are permeating as sort of the, the U.S. culture uh, in, 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 in almost a subconscious uh, way. The freedom of speech and the sense of being in democracies are very deep cultural values that unite America and, the, and India in ways that make it very comfortable for people across these two boundaries. Leaving behind the known, traveling far from home to pit their wits and their grit against the best the world had to offer. The story of the Indian in America is one of undeniable triumph of talent encouraged and rewarded and given a place in the sun. of an age of civil rights transformed immigration policy in America, opening the country to a new breed of immigrants with desperately needed skills in science and math, engineering and medicine. Eager to train and teach at the world's best universities, an influx of Indians arrived, many of whom still remember their first day here in America. I remember um, coming to Stanford and thinking, you know, this campus is so beautiful and so green and, and so nice. That was my first impression uh, of, uh, you know, of, of Stanford University and, and the U.S. as a whole. As a young doctor leaving India, I left with $8 and I borrowed $100 from an uncle. So I had 108 which as you know, in India is an auspicious number. I went to Paris and blew it all in one night at the Moulin Rouge. So when I arrived in the US, I had no money. I remember I left from Bombay, uh, got into a plane, first time getting into a plane, and then uh, landed in Frankfurt and then missed the flight. They put me up in a hotel there, and then we came to New York, and things didn't go according to the plan, but it was adventurous. Uh, I arrived in New York in uh, February, and uh, I remember we drove up to, my brother and I drove up to Syracuse and it was extremely cold. So my first memory is uh, of, of a cold, extremely quiet and less populated, so kind of a lonely place. The roads used to be empty and that was quite a change for somebody from, from India. I still remember the day as if it was yesterday. It was a beautiful fall day in Boston. It's like that. I think I must have walked for miles just back and forth that day. America's best colleges, Howard and Columbia, Stanford and Berkeley, threw open their doors to research fellows and master's students who came here leaving everything they knew, who came here with the burning hunger necessary to succeed. I was working probably 20 hours a day, so my first impressions were really the level of rigor and discipline and hard work. Now fortunately, many of us who grew up in the middle class in India went to IIT Bombay, had to work pretty hard 
So it wasn't that much of a stretch, but it certainly wasn't the easy life in the early years. It was cold, it was miserable, and the house was freezing. Uh, so in January, I actually moved into the library at MIT. So I just got a sleeping bag and I started to live in the libraries at MIT because that was warm. This determination to make it against all odds took these new immigrants to new heights, from students to professors, professors to deans. If someone had asked me to dream my biggest dream that I could possibly imagine when I came to this country, uh, I would have said, you know, if I get tenure at a place like Harvard Business School, that would be uh, my dream come true. That would have been my American dream. I don't think I could have ever imagined the possibility of being dean uh, of Harvard Business School. And as Dean, he's really, I think, made it, made HBS a place where it's easier to be new or to maybe be a little different or maybe not have a business background or any of those things because I think he is, un I think he understands that perspective a lot better coming from where he came from. It's not just about how he can serve the HBS community, but how the HBS community can serve the larger Boston community and um, hopefully eventually the world. Academia and teaching have traditionally been fields to which the diaspora flocked. The combination of financial stability and the chance to fund cutting-edge research is a powerful draw. And moving beyond traditional STEM fields are economists who wasted no time racking up accolades that match their colleagues. And inspiring their work are their experiences in India and America. We went back every few uh, years, you know, to visit relatives, to visit India. And I could really see a lot of the contrast. I think a lot of that motivates the work that I do today. Thinking about social change and thinking about how we can use the tools of economics to improve people's lives, I think has motivated a lot of my interests. I thought it was actually a blessing to be an Indian American because I could sort of pick out some of the really core messages from being an Indian and from being an American. I study choice, and as an Indian I learned that anytime you want to make a choice, you have to consider the limitations. You have to consider the consequences it's going to have on the people around you. It's a very Indian idea. Uh, as an American, I learned that when you want to make a choice, you have to think about what you want and who you are and what the possibilities are and what the opportunities are. And really, uh, one of the ways in which I really benefited from those seemingly contrasting points of view uh, was I was sort of forced to figure out how to put those two together. And that's a ringing endorsement from an expert hailed for nearly two decades worth of seminal work in the art of choosing. But for Sheena herself, living and working in America is the perfect choice. My parents really didn't know what to do with a blind person. They had no idea what possibilities might be there for me. I got very lucky because there were people that did show me options. Um, and I don't know if I could have had that if I had grown up anywhere else. Her books really cover a, a lengthy uh, background from you know why people make decisions and how people make those decisions. It's one thing learning from a textbook. It's a completely different thing if you're learning from a professor who is actually in the trenches and doing it. And Sheena just brings a wealth of experience to her teaching to the classroom. She's actually worked with the leaders of the organizations that she teaches about. Across the country, the liberal bastions of Berkeley are another example of institutions adapting themselves to give everyone, no matter how young, their shot at shaping the American dream of dreaming for the stars and daring to reach even higher. It now gives me great pleasure to present the University Medal to the most distinguished graduating senior on the Berkeley campus, Tankar Das. He's the youngest university medalist in at least a century. Ritanka is indeed a remarkable young man. 
He came to Berkeley when he was just 15, believe it or not. Not only that, um, he quickly became uh, very, very accomplished in two different majors, uh, chemical biology and um, bioengineering. My research has been around the area of cellulose dynamics. So how do you break down cellulose? It's grass. So how do you take energy from grass? So what we're trying to do is develop new methods to use cellulose from you know, regular green material and turn that into biofuels. Quickly finding a place for himself in the famed California sun, Ritanka thrived in an ecosystem that encouraged him to be simply the best and not just the best for his age. Helping him every step of the way was a community of teachers and students who encouraged this precocious teen to challenge them. The way we met, frankly, is that he walked in my office one day and almost without introducing himself, he said, Professor, we need to have a journal for the student. I said, wait a minute, who are you? What do you want to do? We designed a course on the Berkeley campus where students uh, would teach it, me and a few other students, and we got together and we got uh, kind of leaders in industry come in and talk and we took field trips to different places. So students were able to recognize what opportunities were available to them. Colleges, coastlines and California cool are all reasons why Indians flock to this part of America. And one Indian expo that's creating waves is Bombay Jam, where Bollywood meets the American obsession for fitness, creating a dancer size that's Desi style. Bombay Jam is one of the super fun concepts um, of merging fitness, exercise, and making it just uh, into a party atmosphere. Um, it's an, uh, a fusion of what's the best of Bollywood, which is our music, and dance and uh, in Hollywood, considering that we are here, um, and put them together in terms of music and in terms of uh, moves. I love the music, love the energy. Um, got introduced to it watching uh, Bollywood movies and just thought it was an amazing combination of energy, uh, spirit, um, good beats, and uh, everyone looks like they're having so much fun. Oh yeah, I really like Rada. <laughs> it's a pretty good energetic music. This is the this is the beginning, right? And all the moves, right? It's gotta be from the hip. Something like Bombay Jam is also, you know, a little bit more appealing to the mainstream audience. Um, you know, because they love to work out, they love Bollywood music, essentially, and this is perfect. <laughs> The Bollywoodization of America might have started slowly, but it's picking up steam and some fairly die-hard fans. I saw my first Bollywood film in 1991, and it was an Amitabh Bachchan movie, so I fell in love with it. I came here to the Bay Area and I walked into the India West office and I said, I want to work for your paper. And they said, you know, do you know what we're all about? And I said, please take me on. And they could tell that I was completely mad about Indian movies. And so they uh, gave me more and more responsibility. And ever since then, I've gone there maybe 11, 12 times and got married there. And anyway, it's really become an important part of my life. Um, and how did you learn to speak the language? That's so interesting. Film say, heat say. As Hollywood meets Bollywood and forges new connections, so too does the Indian diaspora. Chronicling this dialogue between India and America is India West, a Bay Area publication. India West is primarily a, a forum, a media outlet to portray the Indian American community in the United States, their problems, their issues, their achievements, things like that. So it's very important for a community to grow you need that outlet. With inside access as well as outside perspective, India West is in the enviable position of having witnessed the birth and growth of a community. The Indian American community, uh, when I started working here, 
there were three basic areas that they were very dominant in, or at least uh, prevalent in. And one was the amount of doctors. The second community was the hotel and motel field. And the third area has been technology. Straddling the worlds between academia and enterprise through technology is a peculiarly Silicon Valley trait, where campus labs and innovation centers encourage dynamic new thinking in their students and far-sighted entrepreneurs fund the technologies of tomorrow. And at the forefront of both ideas and angel investments are the Indian diaspora. You know, it's interesting, right? Uh, you know, in my career, uh, I've been constantly interacting with academia and with Stanford, right? I go out, I start a company, I come back, and I go do something else and so on. But around the same time that I was graduating, uh, I got together with a friend of mine and uh, started a venture capital firm called Cambrian Ventures. Um, and in Cambrian Ventures, we invested in, uh, in many companies. Uh, a lot of those companies came from Stanford. Despite starting new companies and working with global mega brands like Amazon and Walmart, Anand still takes out time to mentor young Stanford students working on new ideas. It's, it's important to have someone who's actually got experience on the ground of what it's like to set up a company. They've been through not only the exercise of gathering the thoughts and what the idea is going to be, but also what it takes to go from the idea to make something that someone would be interested in purchasing. These informal mentorships replicate much larger professional networks like the Indus Entrepreneurs that provide support and funding for some of the biggest names in the tech world. So TAI was started about 20 years ago and it was started by five or six very, very successful entrepreneurs of Indian origin here in the Valley. And it could have only started in Valley, it could not have started anywhere else because Valley has this culture of uh, what they call paying forward. So once they have founded their company, they've then taken that money, either started another company or funded another company. So the studies have documented the fact that they have been a huge contribution in Silicon Valley and in fact nationally. Out of the 20 companies that we have funded here in the last two years, uh, I would say that about 10 uh, of them is here non-Indian. Taking advantage of funding and mentorship opportunities available is Rujul Zapade, who dared to give up on Howard for the chance to take his audacious startup, Flight Car, to the next level. Flight Car is peer-to-peer uh, -peer car sharing at airports. Uh, we allow vehicle owners who are parking at the airport uh, to rent out their cars to other incoming travelers to the same airport. Collaborative, low cost eco-friendly and with the potential to upend established car rental behemoths like Hertz and Enterprise, Flight Car is everything America loves. And they rewarded their teenage founders with the faith to follow their dreams. We raised our first round. Uh, we closed it February of this year, early February. Uh, but we started raising in October. So it took us about five months to raise that round. We raised our second round in April of this year. We closed uh, a round that was 11 times larger in two weeks. So it was, you know, having users and uh, was, was, you know, very helpful. Um, and it, it always is, you know, when an investor asks you, well, you know, why, why would anybody use something like this? Um, you know, you're, before users, you know, you have to justify it. But afterwards you can say, well, gee, I have no idea, but people are using it. Silicon Valley, home of the new gold rush. A modern mecca for the meritocratic. Success here has seen the community's status skyrocket and cemented their reputation for being tech geniuses. Indians are only about 2% of the population here in Silicon Valley. But almost 50% of all startups have an Indian connection. But before startup became a verb, and Silicon Valley a destination, tech tycoons like Desh Deshpande and Ramesh Vadhvani were in the forefront of a wave of IITians who came, saw and conquered. Raising capital was virtually impossible and for me to get the first couple of hundred thousand dollars of capital, I actually had to call on 125 venture capital firms. So I guess uh, learned tenacity, learned 
the importance of not taking no for an answer. Lessons that paid off big. But Ramesh's first lesson in entrepreneurship was back at IIT. IIT Bombay had, and particularly my hostel, which was Hostel 2, had absolutely the worst canteen in the city. So we actually started the canteen corporation of Hostel 2 with 10 shareholders. Each of us put 10 rupees into this pot and it actually became a hugely successful cafeteria. There were people coming from all the other hostels and for the first year we declared like a 10,000% dividend. Starting in technology, moving to venture capitalism and then philanthropy. Ramesh and Desh encourage and support countless people across the globe. But close to their heart remains encouraging entrepreneurship and so empowerment in both their country of adoption and origin. The mission of the Vadwani Foundation is to accelerate economic development and to create hopefully millions of jobs. We have had very good experiences, mostly because we had this opportunity to be innovative and entrepreneurial. So we sort of made innovation and entrepreneurship as the key theme for our own foundation. Another approach to philanthropy looks at strengthening the community and helping it integrate even more into America. And one of the foremost initiatives in this arena is M.R. Rangaswamy's brainchild, in diaspora. In diaspora, the group that we started a year ago is trying to do now is to bring all these different professions together. Academics, authors, media people, NGOs, policymakers, tech people, billionaires, you know, everybody together to form a very strong community that can be much more powerful than it is today. <laughs> Cross-cultural collaborations come easily to MR and Krisanti, his Greek-American wife. After all, every day in this house is a symphony between East and West, a conversation between technology and art. We've been married 21 years today. Since we both came from old cultures and traditions, neither of us really had that much of a problem. I found more difficulties with say third, fourth generation Americans who just didn't understand old cultures and old traditions and family ways of doing things. They just thought it was very old fashioned. Another organization working to connect the community is Gopio. Gopio is a global organization and it plays the advocacy role on behalf of the 25 million Indians settled abroad. Gopio looks at all generations together as one block and our job is to bring them together because the issues that they face outside of India are similar, whether it's assimilation, adaptation, confrontation of human rights issues, as well as preservation of cultural identity. While many of the first-generation Indian-American entrepreneurs have moved more towards philanthropy, some still are the heart and soul of their companies. And one such company is Sandisk. A storage solution Supremo, whose products are in practically every camera and phone we use. Known for cutting-edge, high-performance products, SanDisk is a testament to the vision, skill and courage of its three immigrant founders who risked all to start it. When we started SanDisk, my wife and I were expecting our first child. Uh, so making the decision to really give up uh, the comforts and the normal day-to-day -day routine of a regular job at a company is certainly uh, you know, somewhat of a nerve-wracking uh, feeling. Co-founder and now president and CEO, Sanjay's contribution to SanDisk's success is undeniable. Yet few realize that it almost didn't happen, that even his coming to the United States was fraught with difficulties that had to be overcome. The thing that always stands out for me first is how hard it was for me to get the visa to come to the US. The visa got turned down yet again, third time. And at that point, my dad was furious. And as he was walking to the office, 
he grabbed the counselor and for next 20 minutes my dad blasted him that how much opportunity he's depriving me of by not giving me the visa given that I'm admitted to University of California Berkeley and lo and behold after 20 minutes the counselor gave me the visa. Building on their reputation as innovators and engineers, Indians haven't just conquered Silicon Valley, but have also climbed the corporate ladder, heading some of the biggest companies here in America. Whether it's Microsoft's Satya Nadella, Adobe's Shant Nunarayan, or Mastercard's Ajay Banga, America's best is entrusted to America's brightest. You know, just being able to be part of the brand of a company like Adobe with Photoshop and you know its presence in imaging was a very attractive thing for me. So you know, I joined in the uh, as one of the general managers and my journey has taken me from doing that to doing engineering to you know running more and more of the businesses and you know eventually uh, running the company. I didn't come overseas thinking that I would get the kind of opportunities I got. I came overseas because at that point of time it looked like a good job in a company I was committed to. I had no idea where it could go. Ajay is part of a new breed of visionaries unconstrained by geography, traveling the world to helm some of the biggest corporate names. Making the journey in reverse is another Indian, Vishal Sikka who polished his management style over the course of starting two companies and working with SAP. From 2010 onwards, then I ran the technology group for SAP, including all the technology products, and we delivered HANA, which has in the meantime become quite a sensation. From being the first Indian to become a member of the board of directors of any German company, to being the first non-founder to chair Infosys, Vishal's corporate ride brings him back to India, where his journey to success started. Growing up in India, I always felt that there was a, a kind of an instinct to excel, not only to survive, but to excel, to be unique, to, to do things that nobody else was doing. When you come to the U.S., in a sense, you already have an, uh, you're an entrepreneur ready to go if you just take that extra step. This extra step into entrepreneurship wasn't just limited to the digital world. Investments in brick and mortar are also a huge and hugely visible part of the diaspora success story. I built the station right from scratch. And from there on, with any further locations that I've added, I've added them with real estate. Currently, I own 30 locations. I started with a very old cottage kind of property, and I built from one hotel to nine hotels. And I employed close to 200 employees. Hotels, motels, gas stations, 7-Elevens, and Dunkin' Donuts. All businesses which see extremely high rates of Indian entrepreneurship requiring as it does hard work, but offering perks that are invaluable to Indians with their strong sense of family and community. One thing I like about the hotel business, uh, we can stay with the husband, work together, and same time we can uh, have a free time, so you can spend a lot of time for the community work, well, I think the Indian American community has been successful because of the values that we were raised with, values of hard work, values of opportunity, values of building for the next generation. Now, those are traditional Indian values, but those are also values that are core to America. This confluence of Indian and American values might explain Ami Bera's success and the resonance he has in the mostly non-Indian community that elected him to the U.S. House of Representatives. I ran for Congress in a district that is less than 1% Indian American, less than 10% Asian. So yeah, I got elected in a district that's reflective of what America looks like, based on who I am, not running away from the values that I was raised with.
Moving from behind the scenes fundraisers, Nikki Haley, Bobby Jindal, Kamala Harris, and of course, Ami Bera are the first of a generation of Indian Americans to have entered public life. I'd like to see four or five Indian American congressmen, and I'd like to see our first congresswoman. I'd like to see an Indian American senator in our lives, and who knows? I mean, I'd love to see an Indian American president in my lifetime. Could Silicon Valley serve as a springboard to higher office? Or perhaps San Francisco, a city that's always opened its arms to all immigrants and once provided safe haven to those who would use it as a base to fight for freedom from all oppression, all colonial rule. I was at the Pravasi Divas. While over there, I realized that there is no mention of the unsung heroes of the freedom movement, which is called Gadar. Started in the early 20th century to combat racist immigration policies in America and Canada, the Gadar party eventually began to agitate for Indian independence from British rule. Yet, their story remains largely unknown. I met the children of some of the Gadarites at that uh, Pravasi Divas. I met professors who have written history books, which are barely we know about. And I thought somebody needs to make a movie. Somebody needs to let the Indians know who these people were. Research of a different kind motivates Anahita Dastur who's part of the huge contingent of Indian origin medical professionals practicing in America. Bringing up a child in a new land, living far from home is never easy. But for Anahita, it's a sacrifice she's willing to make. What I am doing professionally here may not be possible in India. So in that sense, it's a struggle. Uh, I would like to go back, but I still have a lot to accomplish here before I can go back. Anahita's work, like that of others who've gone before her, holds the potential to immeasurably improve lives. I was involved and has been extremely uh, successful in the uh, development of the eczema laser that uh, gave us the Allergic procedure. I wanted to basically remove contacts and glasses from my daily life. As a performer, I always wanted to dance and to move, and wearing glasses was just inconvenient. So when I was old enough, I got a consultation and they said I was a great candidate, so I got the surgery basically to make my life easier. Be it in research or in direct patient care, Indian origin doctors and nurses are a vital backbone of American health care. Not only do they heal, they're also forcing a change in the conversation, pushing for more holistic forms of medicine. There are pockets of great scholars in India whose uh, wisdom and knowledge is still not exposed to the West because it is couched in ancient terms or language uh, and it has a cultural uh, connotation to it. If you take that same uh, material and give it a modern language, I don't talk about cities, I talk about non-local correlations. I, so, you know, I talk about consciousness and biology. Sharing aspects of Indian tradition and culture is something the diaspora is proud to do. And as the second and third generation of Indian Americans come of age, it's become a valuable way to keep in touch with India. Being able to say I went to India and explain all my different experiences was like, it was great. I mean, nobody had ever heard it. They were intrigued by it, so I felt proud. I mainly enjoy making the food. It's my favorite thing ever. I love to cook, and the food is just amazing. It's highly important to us. These simple things as making dokla, simple things as learning how to make Indian food, highly important, because that's how we transfer culture. Taking the personal and making it professional is top chef Floyd Cardoz. A Bombay boy, he eschewed the traditional Indian career in science for one in kitchen chemistry. 
I wanted to introduce people to the flavors of India first and said spice are not bad because people are afraid of spicy food. So I wanted to introduce them to flavors that they would enjoy using seasonal ingredients like we cook in India. And ensuring he has the flavors of India close at hand is Floyd's ultimate luxury, a rooftop garden perched in New York's spectacular skyline. I felt that for the Indian who are in the United States, the second generation and third generation Indians, for them to become chefs and to get into this business became a lot easier because someone from the subcontinent was able to do it successfully. So after that, I started getting calls from a lot of parents saying, hey, my son wants to be a chef, my daughter wants to be a chef. Would you mind talking to us as to how difficult, how easy it is? Second generation Indians have a greater uh, diversity of careers now. Um, not just becoming engineers and doctors and lawyers, but there are uh, Indian young people who play in rock bands, who pursue modern dance, who you know, work in all sorts of jobs and business. Taking advantage of the freedom to pursue their passions are musicians like pianist Vijay Ayer and saxophonist Rudresh Mahantapa. I'm associated with this field of music that's called jazz, which is quintessentially American and itself is embedded in America's racial history, very much seen in black and white. So where is a place for a, someone of Asian descent who's a child of immigrants in the middle of all of that? Doubts that were initially expressed but soon put to rest by this maestro and his music. The recipient of a MacArthur Genius Grant in tenure at Howard, Ayer is the living embodiment of the commingling of cultures. both Indian and American, as is fellow musician Rudresh Mahantapa. I want to convey that sense of, of being Indian and American and neither and both all at the same time. So whether I'm playing in a very Western setting or a hybrid sort of setting with Indian musicians, I'm still looking for creating a, a sound that inhabits both spaces and is not exotic in any way. Synthesis of a different kind takes place in Harlem in Manhattan. Here at the city's famed Harlem Dance Theatre, it takes the form of a South African Indian finding home in a predominantly African-American space. It was very empowering to be in a society that had so many different cultural influences, uh, both here at the Dance State of Harlem itself, but also just in the larger environment, in the city itself. From dancer to teacher, and now to running the company, Levine's love for a storied Harlem institution is palpable in the care he takes with his students. Levine is a very strict teacher. I think that's where I got a lot of my self-discipline from, though, because he taught us that we have to put the responsibility on ourselves to, you know, do what we need to do and not always have somebody telling us or looking over your shoulder telling you what to do, you know. You have to do it for yourself, and that's the only way to get better. Enjoying success, enjoying acceptance, and now, enjoying becoming a part of the American melting pot, Indian Americans have come a long way in a short time. When I came here, uh, Indians were primarily known for motels, you know. Here in California, they were known for being farmers. So from that time to now, where we are perceived as leaders, as, uh, as highly educated people who are leaders in, in engineering, in technology, in, in the digital world, 
uh, it's been quite an extraordinary change. A decade or 15, uh, 15 years ago, that perception was that these are excellent workers. That perception is now changing to these are excellent investors, these are excellent job creators in the company. They say it's easier, you know, in the U.S. for Indian Americans to branch out from the traditional sort of roles. There is a growing number in the media world who are actually filmmakers, who are writers, uh, musicians. Documenting these experiences is Preston Merchant, a Bay Area photographer who's traveled the world, photographing the diaspora and in the process has fallen in love with India. My own family experience is affected by Indian migration. My wife came over in the 80s also, so I've had an experience of diaspora myself in addition to seeing it in 14 countries around the world through my explorations in photography. It's been a wonderful experience. In fact, I have got to know India more through his eyes than I have of my own. In this melting pot, Indians have become American and in the process made America a little more Indian creating new families while retaining old bonds, improving immeasurably their lives, their communities, their new country. The South Asian community here is fascinating because it is so integrated, it is such a normal part of life. Uh, I got lucky and I worked at a startup company that brought me here. Um, and then since then, I haven't looked back. I think that I learn a deeper appreciation for Indian culture every time she picks up a new thing. For example, um, bangles. I love bangles. Uh, and, and I thought no one loved bangles more than I did. I was wrong. My daughter loves bangles more than I love bangles. We're a unique mix of people from all over the world. One, uh, it gives me a very broad insight into many, many different cultures. Uh, including India, which is huge. I've been able to achieve my dreams here. Nobody's ever questioned me being a woman or the fact that I'm not American. Never felt those, never felt those. You know, I just, whatever I want to do, I've been able to do over here, which I feel this country is giving me that option. By and large, I would say, if you talk to Americans as to which immigrant community particularly recent immigrants, that they have the most admiration for, most would say Indian Americans. And the reason is because Indian Americans contribute so much and take so little. Traveling to a new world, making it their own. Indians in America have sought and found their place in the sun.